Mr. Stevens, good morning, Mr. Longridge, how are we? Good morning, very well, thank you. All good, yeah, hi there. Good. So, this is our third video now, I believe, in all. Um, in this case, we're going to be talking about the design brief, which is criteria 1.2 as part of the NEA. Um, so, Mr. Longridge, why is it important that, that we have a design brief when we, uh, when we look to embark upon a project? Right, well, the, the design brief is uh, the part of the project that forms the basis for the rest of the project. So at this point in time, you've already started thinking about the existing problems out there. You've completed two pages of research, so you've thought about, uh, you've looked up things on the internet, you've found out exactly what the current thinking is, and hopefully you're now in a situation to start bringing all those pieces together into one uh, succinct document that suggests how your project could go. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the design brief is the foundation of your project. It's the, the statement that will shape the, where the rest of your project goes. 100%. So it's, it's vitally important that this first, it's almost a document, isn't it? Or like, a, mm -hmm. like a, a pledge as to what it is that you're going to commit yourself to throughout the project. So it's, it's vitally important that this is right, isn't it? That's it's, right, it, yeah. It's, it's quite early to to do this I think it, what we need to do is it's almost an initial brief and then come back to it once we put a bit more thought into the project that we're going to be be focusing on because um, right now you've just done some research you probably don't know exactly the sort of thing that you want to do which is which is a good position to be in um, so it's difficult to get that balance we need we need a brief that has enough detail that kind of gives a good idea of, of what you want to do but it's not so specific that it, it closes doors for you further in the project yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point I mean we have had candidates in the past that have pivoted somewhat later on in the project because they may have met obstacles that they can't overcome or something may have changed, they may have found some additional research. Um, but I think you are right, Mr. Stevens, that it is, it is rather early, but this obviously gives us a statement of intent for the, for the sort of project to follow. Um, Mr. Long, as you mentioned there about the, the research that's been carried out in 1.1, uh, in um, and you're right, it, it's about unearthing those problems. And if you think back to the last video, I was talking about looking for statistics and statements that, yeah. that authenticate a problem. And I think for me personally, I would always expect that that first paragraph in a design brief outlies those problems um, from the outset. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it really is shaping together the pieces. Uh, you need that contextual evidence. Hopefully that will play into the narrative that you've already said uh, within page one, two and three. So you've already kind of explained your thoughts and, and talked about how you feel like these this pieces of research could inform your project. So really now it is bringing it together. Uh, and if we were to have a look at one of the pages, if we were to start with example uh, 1H, we could see there that this student on the left has actually added a handwritten notes where they've thought about potential design brief ideas. So they've thought about what their researchers, what the preliminary research has shown them, and then they've kind of grouped it together into four key areas. Uh, as Mr. Stevens and Mr. Stoker rightly said there, it's, it's important that you don't become too focused at this point in time. So if you were doing perhaps the, the furniture design project for a multi-purpose furniture or multi-purpose working from home, I'd be really reluctant to say, I'm going to make a chair or I'm going to make a, a table that does this because that's limiting your potential. In this, these design brief ideas, you really want to, to keep them quite open. So you might say something like uh, to, to explore the possibility of a piece of furniture that provides multiple uses to really open that design brief up and keep a bit of a, a, a structure. And, oh, it's structured, but it's open. It forms the foundations of your project. That's right. I think it's a really good idea to, to try to generate two or three design briefs and then just spend some time thinking about pl plausible, plausibly which one is going to be the best for you in terms of logistically, you know, do, will you have a target customer, a primary user for each of those briefs? Will you be able to manufacture something um, of, of this size or scale or using the set of materials that you're thinking of within the school, within the school workshop? So if you can do two or three or four possible design briefs and then just spend a day or two having to think about it, talking to people about it, and then that should narrow your thoughts on which one you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. And that's a good example that you've put up there because they've got the possible briefs and they've also then uh, advantages, disadvantages or pros and cons for each one so that you can see as an examiner, as somebody moderating this work, I can see the thinking, I can see how that student thinks that it could work because of this or any issues that could limit that potential project. 
really good. So I think from the outset then what we're talking about, we must identify the problem. We must support that problem with authentic research from the previous uh, criteria point. And there is scope for this project and challenges identified. What about, it? should, should we encourage students to reference the context in that design brief as well, do we think? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's quite important when it comes to writing up the actual design brief, uh, if we could just go back to 1H again, Mr. Stevens, uh, it's really important there that within the, the actual design brief context, so here it's the orange one, it should have some kind of statement that links back to factual data that you found in your research. Uh, that could be something like you've uh, identified the, the value that music plays within children's education. So it might be a statistic that says uh, if students play an instrument, they may perform better later in life. I'm not sure where you get that information, but if you found out the information, you would add that information to your design brief to form the, the leverage to support what you're saying. Uh, one of the worst things you can do is just write, I want to design and make a musical instrument that's for kids, because that doesn't really tell us why. So there's a justification that you've clearly identified in your research. Uh, in this one, there's a perfect example. You've got on the top key pieces of information highlighted as quotes that then form together into that design brief. Uh, it says 1,920 plastic water bottles are on average purchased each, each week. Right, that's a key piece of information that really does give that design brief an awful lot more credibility. I like how this is a, a bit of a working document as well. It's, it's not all perfectly typed up. It, it's mm -hmm. showing this student's thought process just in the form of a few written notes as opposed to typed up. Yeah, in that uh, you'd almost class that as live annotation. So traditionally in, in projects, you'd say that this, this idea of interacting live with your product, e project, even more easily now on iPads so that you can open up your iPad document and handwrite notes over the top. It shows a real engagement with what the data and what the information is on your page. So yeah, a very nice way of presenting your ideas and thoughts more clearly. We've seen this a few times in, in, in the previous cohort, haven't we? Another way that you can do that is if you are to find valuable information, you can print that out, you can live annotate, as Mr. Longridge calls it, um, as you're going through that document and then rescan that um, to go back into your document. It, it looks fantastic. And, and for those students that do do that, they, they do show evidence that they are very, very deep thinkers in terms of in terms of the content and, and, and the research that they find. Yeah. Um, just going so back to... Sorry. Sorry, the, the alternative there is just highlighting like like the students done on the page in certain places as well. It could be a case of if, if it's um, if it's not a printed document, if it's online, it could be a case of taking that the research, referencing it and then just highlighting certain sections that are of importance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it goes into one of the latest strands, doesn't it, where, where I think it's strand five when they ask about are you being reflective on, on the, the work in 1.1 and, and um, this is, is certainly a way to evidence that. Um, to the moderator. Um, yeah, I just want to go back to, to a statement that you, that you made, Mr. Longridge, which was about um, you were talking about how design briefs need to have a broad range and scope. And the example that you gave was was rather limited when you talked about an instrument for for children um, to enhance experience, for example. Um, what I do want to draw upon there is, is it, it is important to identify a primary user and the wider stakeholder, isn't it? At this point. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's going up at one point three, isn't it? It will filter into 1.3 as well, yeah, but I do believe that that design brief should absolutely identify who this is for, um, you know, what is the purpose of the product and, and who is going to eventually be the primary user. I think that yeah. does that does filter in and of course, as you said, Mr. Stevens, 1.3 is about finding that primary user and, and interviewing them and finding as much primary research as possible. Yeah, there's a, at this point for me, I'm, I'm looking for an inclination of who it could be rather than who necessarily is the target user. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, if you go back to 1H, it has been greyed out for privacy reasons, but this student at this point in time is bringing together her design brief, but thinking that these are the people that she has access to. So I, I think that these were her parents and there was a, her sister as well. So she's thinking that these are people that could be linked to this project, but also in context. So she was thinking about growing uh, fruit and vegetables at home these would be a perfect target audience as well. So when we spoke in one of the previous videos about thinking about your, your contacts and people that you have access to, this is where hopefully your ideas will be forming into a, a final 
uh, your final brief because you thought, well, this person, th these people that I work with would be an ideal candidate for this kind of product. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, moving on then, um, one of the key competencies for 1.2 reads areas for particular attention in the designing, uh, for example, safety, usability, function. Um, it's something that's sometimes overlooked by, by our students in that we don't necessarily focus on a, like the wider implications of design. So, um, you know, I kind of think to the sort of everyday activities context where we're talking about older people you know in that design brief they could specifically highlight that ergonomics could be uh, a key focus for the project I and mean, would you agree most definitely i think that it all of this relates to who um, the researcher found what that suggests will be a, a pathway forward for you and then anything else that you can bring into it support it such as the ergonomic uh, viability of how easy it is to use and the functionality of it can come into this Absolutely. I mean, but, you know, I kind of look at things like, particularly for papers and boards, what we could focus on is sustainability. Mm -hmm. We could have a clear focus on the six R's, for example, um, yeah. you know, looking at cradle to cradle design so that we can dismantle products back into their original components, energy efficiency, fair trade. I mean, the list goes on, but mm -hmm. just think that as a, as a subsidiary, what we could do is we could focus on those key wider, uh, wider implications of design that just to show kind of the, the the knowledge that's been attained through yeah. the core the core knowledge so to speak really yeah i think it's important that everything flows through as well it's, there's no there's no point doing several pieces of research and then not using that research to, to inform your design brief you've got to make sure that like i said in the last video it, it needs to tell a story uh, it, ne it needs to flow through and make sense chronologically yeah that's really important 100 percent. so um I think it would be um, of benefit if we, is, are there any of the examples that we haven't been through yet? Have we been through all of them? We haven't looked at this one, one J. J, I don't believe. Okay. So again, something similar here, isn't there, where, you know, the design brief ideas are clearly highlighted from, from, a, from, a, from, the, from the outset, essentially. Um, just again, to keep that broad scope of openness, um, rather than pinpointing um, the, the intentions definitely from from this early stage, I think, which is was was obviously a concern of yours, wasn't it, Mr. Stevens, that we can't just pigeonhole ourselves, you know, on page four, for example. Two, right? Yeah, we need to we need to keep our our options open. Um, I have had a couple of students emailing me already saying I'm going to make this, but you, you can't. You've got to back off. You've got to leave yourself time to come up with ideas and develop those ideas uh, into something that's innovative. Uh, so do not decide what your project is right now. It's far too early. Yeah. You'd, uh, you could almost um, imagine it as if you're stood and you're looking out over where you could go. So you're setting out the scope of what you could do from a, a fixed point in time. So the information you've had at the moment has informed your thinking. At this point, you're looking where could you go? What potential opportunities could you explore rather than actually following a pathway down to that at this point in time? So yeah, as open and as fluid as you can really help. Wonderful. Uh, anything else to add then? Um, to this. That's everything from me, I think so, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, well, I, I, I must remember to thank Mr Longridge in this video because he got upset with me last time. Uh, so thank you Mr Stevens, thank you Mr Longridge and thank you, Mr. Stoko. in our next video which will concern stakeholder needs and wants and primary user needs. Fantastic, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. See you later. Goodbye. Cool.